Hello, my name is John Evans. Uh, this is my talk as part of the Bournemouth University Eating Disorders Awareness Week on my life living with anorexia and uh, my recovery from the illness. Everyone else that you've heard from today is an expert in their field, will be able to tell you far more about eating disorders than I can. But what I can talk about is my anorexia and the way I experienced it and where it came from and a little bit about how I've taken steps to recover from it. As we saw earlier, what everyone, the one thing if you ask people what they know about anorexia is that it's low weight. People lose weight, people are thin. But it is about so much more than that. And if there's one thing I'd like you all to take away from that, it's to perhaps break through that perception a little bit, to look at the other ways that it does affect your life. Because really, the low weight is just one of the symptoms of an eating disorder. And it's just the starting place for a recovery. And it's really only one part of the whole experience of what living with an eating disorder is like. Now, I just put this on a little bit of context. Um, this is kind of the part of my story. Um, I was diagnosed with anorexia when I was 18. I'm now 34. So this has pretty much been half of my life. has been surrounded by this illness. I've been an inpatient twice at Kimbridge Court. First time made the weight, but didn't really make any of the changes that I needed to, which is why I had to go back. Um, and uh, I began my recovery about four years ago, and I published my book uh, the year after I came out of Kimbridge. Now, as I say, when you ask people about anorexia, the first thing they probably will say is it's about low weight. Second thing will be that it affects girls. And the third thing would probably be that, oh, they see a picture in the paper and that sends them off on this huge mental journey to being as thin as they can possibly be. Now, that wasn't really the case for me. Um, when I was 14, um, I'd had five or six years of bullying about being overweight. And I just kind of came to the conclusion that they weren't going to stop bullying me, so I had to change myself. And the one thing that I thought I could do would be to lose weight. And uh, that was my solution. Um, now, images such as these which are the type of thing which get, you know, are meant to lead us into eating disorders, that didn't really start to affect me until my anorexia had taken hold. Because then I was focused on the messages I was getting from here that if you've got a muscly body, you can have great sex, and there's 62 ways to get the girl, most of which I thought were concentrated on that body. And it was only when anorexia had taken hold and I was on the lookout for all these messages and affirmation of what I was doing, proof that what I was telling myself was true, that obesity was horrific and that the only way to be acceptable was to be thin. And that's when I started getting the messages from these magazines because to be honest, these magazines only really print what their readers want to read because they're businesses, they're not going to put something in there if they're not going to sell the papers. And most people can look at that and take the correct message from it and be fine with it and use it in a positive way. I couldn't do that because my mind was telling me that to be like that, I had to just keep exercising and not eat. So I'm completely messed up, really. But that was the way I was interpreting it. And if anything, these magazines, these images are guilty of reflecting society back at us. I wanted a six pack because I thought that that's what society wanted me to have. That was what society was demanding that I had as a man, was to be fit and strong and to work all day and then go down the gym for two hours. And, uh, and after I released my book, I had a number of media opportunities, newspapers, magazines, TV programs. And without exception, they all asked me for a picture of when I was ill. And 
at first, that was fine. You know, I thought, oh, you know, because after all, a picture paints a thousand words. It has more impact than uh, anything that I could say, really. And these were all visual media, and that's how they were getting their message across. So I agreed to that at first. And the way that they sold it to me, that they wanted the pictures, was firstly because it would show how serious the illness is. And it does to a certain extent. It does show the physical aspect. But it takes no account of all the rest of the bit that comes with it, all the mental problems and all of that. And the second thing they told me was it would show me how far I'd come. And that, I, that couldn't be further from the truth. Because being a healthy weight, as I said, is just the starting point. How far I've come is being able to live at a healthy weight, to be able to cope with it, to be able to accept it. Getting to the healthy weight was just it was the easy bit, really. I could do that, I proved that, but when I came out of hospital the first time, I couldn't cope with it. So the second time I came out of hospital, the real success I've had is to be here four years on and be able to stand in front of you all and feel acceptable. And as I say, at first, I did send all these photos off, and I was fine with it. But there were two things kind of nagging at the back of my mind. I'd done quite a bit of work for Beat, and they're very much against the use of these photos and images, because, as they say, it can be very harrowing for someone going through an eating disorder to see a picture of someone else, because it sets targets, it makes you feel as if you're not thin enough, really. That if I'd seen a photo like that, I'd have thought, oh, well, actually, I'm not as bad as them. So I must be all right, or my case isn't that serious. But most importantly for me, it made me question why I had those photos still on me. And what I concluded, really, was that it was all part of how I still hadn't really let go of the eating disorder. Because the eating disorder, to me, had in part been a protection. If I had anorexia, no one could expect me to succeed at anything. No one could expect me to have a relationship or be good at my job. So if I ever failed, it was a fantastic excuse for me. And I realized that even though I'd recovered the weight and I was in recovery, that I still had those photos because just in case in the future I made a mistake or I didn't do a good job or something. Whereas I could no longer say, oh, you know, I'm thin, I'm anorexic, you can't expect me to do that. I could pull these photos out and go, yeah, I know I failed at that, but look at how well I've done. So as I took the decision, having discovered that's why I and keeping these photos to get rid of them and rip them up and destroy them and cancel them off my computer and everything. And it took a lot of groveling to all the media companies that I'd sent these photos out to not to use them, but thankfully most of them did. And we turned it around and I gave them this photo, which is me being lovely and happy, uh, before anorexia came into my life and the story was turned from, oh my God, look how thin he was and look how good he is now, to, oh, look how happy he was before this horrible illness came into his life and just messed things up for years. Um, I'd love to say that all the media companies were quite as cooperative as that. Um, some of them, once I said I couldn't give them a photo, just cut, you know, it went no further. That was it. If I couldn't give them a photo, they weren't going to give me the interview. Um, I won't mention any names, but um, <laughs> as I say, certain companies aren't quite as good as others. Oh dear, that wasn't that. Something like that. Now, part of the reason why I wrote the book was because when I was looking for something about men, about men with eating disorders, there just didn't seem to be anything out there. I'd read 100 books and it would all be about her eating disorder, the way she was dealing with her anorexia. And I can't deny that women get affected more than men. 
that's scientific proof. I mean, you've had all the stats, all the stats are up there. It's usually between about 10 and 25% of cases. Um, certainly BEATS have established that there's about 10% of diagnosed cases are men. Although that's generally accepted to be an underestimate because of the stigma that's attached to it. These are female illnesses. And a lot of men aren't going to go to the GP with a female illness. And through my work with the quite excellent Men Get Eating Disorders 2 website, um, I've come across a lot of anecdotal notes, messages of GPs just dismissing it. One gentleman I know went with clear signs of an eating disorder and was told to man up and get over it. Uh, thankfully, um, and as I said, I can only talk from my own experience, I haven't encountered that. I've never felt that as a man I've been disadvantaged at all. Um, even when I was on the inpatient unit and I must have spent, I don't know, there must have been over 30 people that I've been on the unit with at one time and only one of them was a man. And being amongst all those women was fine for me, to be honest. It was the first time I'd ever really allowed myself any access to women at all because I've been too scared of them. And it was great and very positive. And I also found that whereas eating disorders can be very, very competitive, very, very competitive, especially in that environment, I could stand away from that, really, because <coughs> I wasn't seen as competition. And... So, and the general perception, as I say, is of being this, as a man, being very distinct, being unusual, because one in ten, because nine of ten are going to be women. But for me, the experience of being a man with an eating disorder is less about being a man and more about having an eating disorder and how that distinguishes me from the other men. So whereas all my mates were out drinking and socialising and chasing women and going out for takeaways at two o'clock in the morning, I was the grey gentleman in the corner, being very cold, and not wanting to join in. And it's when I look back now at how I lived through my eating disorder, as I say, it's not about any disadvantages I had as a man. It's about everything that I missed out on that my mates were enjoying. And that is something that was particularly apposite when I went to university. Now, as I say, university is meant to be the greatest time of your life. It's brilliant. Whoa, it's everything's fantastic and happening. And for most people, again, it is. Um, and I went back in 1998, which is such a long time ago. And everyone actually thought Tony Blair was a nice bloke. Um, never heard of Facebook. What the hell was that? And amazingly, and this is where I lose half the audience, I got a grant in my first year. It was that long ago. And I managed to get through university, three years of university, with no debt at all. Now, partly that was the bank of mum and dad, partly it was the grant that I got. But also, it was just because basically for me, university as a social experience didn't happen at all. I got there, there's all these amazing societies and everything else, and there was a sports club ticket for £25 for the year. So I thought, this is brilliant. I'm just going to sign up to every sports society I possibly can. Because when I'd been at school, if I take you back to that 14-year-old boy that decided to lose weight, once I lost weight, the reaction I got was fantastic. The people that had bullied me before were suddenly going, whoa, John, you look really good. A couple of people even said I'd looked anorexic. Which... And the boost to my self-esteem from that was unbelievable, better than anything I'd ever felt. But I knew that when I got to university, all the new people that I'd meet had never met John when he was fat. So that achievement that I'd had meant nothing. And I felt that in order to maintain that self-esteem and that popularity, I would have to exercise more, get fitter, and basically prove what a high achiever I was again. So that, as soon as I got the sports club ticket, I was, I was away 
uh, football club, tennis club, circuit training, gym twice a day, all that kind of thing. And within six weeks, I was in a GP surgery, having lost one and a half stone. And she's saying to me the word anorexia. Oh, that's rubbish. That's what those weird girls get. And from that point, really, that was university for me. It was just three years of studying and being in my room and not really eating much and not going out. And just not having a fantastic time of it. And I got a degree, but not a huge else came out of it. And that's, again, part of the reason why I'm doing this, because hopefully something that I say might twig in something, something you've seen today might stop someone having that same university experience that I did. Because it should be the best time of your life. And it kind of wasn't, really. But, uh, that was the next one. No. But before I get into the happy bit about how I recovered, I'm a bit more misery for you. I just want to explain a little bit more about what it's like to live with an eating disorder. And again, try and bring the emphasis away from concentrating on weight. Because the weight aspect is rubbish. You're tired all the time, you're aching, you've got cuts all over your feet. It's, just, it's all a bit of an agony to walk. But the thing is, you adapt to that. You change your life around it, and you accept it, because the anorexia gives you the one thing that you value above all else. And for me, that was proof against being fat because I knew that above all else no one could have a go at me for being fat because I was anorexic it was official and that's what kept the illness so close and that's why I put up with all the physical aspects all the tiredness and all the cuts <coughs> and everything else now as I say I can only talk about my eating disorder really although having shared my experience with other people, there are themes going through it. Everyone says that the mental aspects are worse than the physical ones. That's pretty much a given. And the horrible irony of eating disorders is that while we, the sufferers, and I, the sufferer, was the only one really that had the power to get over it. I was the only one really that could make the change with help. I cannot exaggerate quite how little power I felt I had, how little choice I felt I had about any of it. These are not uh, lifestyle choices. They aren't uh, cries for attention. They are 24-hour constant just monotony of weighing yourself, walking, standing up, putting food in the bin, getting back on the scales, walking again, getting back on the scales, getting to bed. If I could go to bed at the same weight as the same weight I'd, as I had got up in the morning, that was a good day. If I did less exercise, I would then reduce the amount of food I was eating. If I ate less food, I wouldn't necessarily change the exercise. And that's the cycle you get into. And I could have spent the whole time here just going through everything that I used to do, all the things I used to change, everything in life that was adapted to tie into my anorexia. I'm not going to do that because it will be boring for you and probably wouldn't do me much good. But this is just a very short representation of just some of the things that you change, you work out the most anorexic way of doing. Just the most basic things in life. Washing up and reading the newspaper and talking on the phone. And it gives me a good excuse to put a picture of a dog in there, which is always cheery. And, uh, but it's weird because every tiny thing becomes so important. And if you get into a routine of doing the same things at the same time, the same day, again and again and again, and if you walked up one curb one day, you had to do it again and again and again. Because if you didn't, what 
if that was the one thing that sent you spiralling off. Because you get into this mindset where there is fat and there is thin and there is nothing in between it. And you convince yourself that you're on this precipice of if you change one little thing of your routine, it'll send you hurtling offwards into being fat and being bullied again and being picked on and being a failure because the one thing that you've achieved is that you're thin. And uh, it's uh, the next one. If, I, if nothing else, and forgive me for quoting from my own book, um, I think this kind of sums up what I feel about it. When everything else is going to ruins, I can just touch my ribs and everything is okay again. Because anorexia gave me the, the confidence and the self-respect and the sense of control that I couldn't get from anything else. I was rubbish at my jobs. I had no relationships. I pushed my parents away. I, I just kept myself to myself. But so anorexia and being thin was the one thing that I was confident that I was good at and that I thought society and people would appreciate. And that's why it was so, so difficult to let go. Because, and the real tragedy about eating disorders and about anorexia is that you do all this stuff. You do exactly what it tells you to do. You go for all the walks, you cut out the food, you push people away, you hide yourself. You'd have this monotonous 24-hour treadmill and every day is the same. And at the end of it, you're still not happy and it's never enough because no target, there, there is no target. The barrier just keeps going on and on and on and anorexia will push you on and on and on until, as we saw before, unfortunately, it can be fatal. Some people get help. Fortunately, I did get help second time around because it, it took a lot though. And people ask me sometimes, you know, what was it? What turned it around? And unfortunately, I can't pull that magic wand out. I can't say that's the thing you have to do because as I say everyone is different. Everyone will have their own reasons the eating disorder came across and their own way of getting out of it. But there's a few... Essentially, the achievement of being the thinnest person around that I had at school and which I continued into university was replaced after I came out of Kimbridge at healthy weight with the sense that I'd done it, I'd recovered. And my proof of that wasn't necessarily my weight because that went back down again. But my proof was that I'd been in once and that was it. Because I'd been in with a few people that had been in six, seven, eight, nine, ten times and hadn't cracked it. But I'd been in there once and I was fine, sorted. <coughs> so all I had to do was stay out. And that even included reaching the point where I knew that I hadn't beaten anorexia, I could tell that. And I was just fed up of hoping, essentially. So I sat my parents down and I said, look, I've had years of trying to fight this. It hasn't worked, so just let me give up. Just let me give in to the anorexia. It will, it will quieten. It will leave me alone, and I will just get on with my life. And I was very confident that that would happen. But it didn't. It got louder and louder. Even worse, it just kept getting worse and worse. And there must have been something in me, I don't know, some little bit that still had the hope that it could make a difference. And shortly before I came in back to Kimridge, I met Jess, who works for I Eat. And she was the first person, generally the first person, that I'd met who had recovered. And sometimes when you're going through anorexia, <coughs> recovered people are a bit like unicorns. They're kind of mythical. You know, you kind of think, well, they say they're, you know, they say that you can recover from this, but when you experience it, it's difficult to believe. 
but actually meeting Jess and hearing her story made me think, well, if she can do it, maybe. So I went back and I got referred and they said we'd have you back into Kimridge. And once I'd done that, once I'd got over that barrier, it was a very big barrier, everything else kind of seems possible, maybe. Once I'd overcome the shame of coming back, then what else did I have? But this time I knew that it was the last time. And the last time, the first time, I knew that all I'd really done was put on weight. I had done nothing to, underlie, to attack the underlying problems that I'd had, the bullying that had sort of set me on this pathway, and the low self-esteem that kept, it, kept the anorexia close. And I knew that this second time, I had to change things. I had to take risks. I had to take the risk that everything I've been telling myself, that I was different, that... If I ate something, my weight would escalate, whereas everyone else was different. I had to take the risk that that was wrong. I had to take the risk that I was an okay person. I had to take the risk that I could go for a day without walking and my weight wouldn't balloon, and that I could have an extra chip and my weight wouldn't balloon, and that I could have sauce on my food and my weight wouldn't balloon. But until I tried this stuff, it's all blows up as a big fear and you just can't get over it. And I also had to accept that there was someone different. See, when you're, in the, when you're outside in real life, the only thing that defines you really is your anorexia because that's the first thing people see, it's the first thing you think about, it's the first thing your parents ask about, it's the first thing your friends ask about. On an eating disorders unit, that's the one thing that doesn't define you. And quite frankly, there are people in there that took anorexia to a boundary beyond I could possibly imagine. So suddenly you have to find something else to define you. And slowly, the personality that has been hidden for so many years is allowed to come out. And suddenly, while this personality was coming out, people were giving me positive feedback. And actually... This wasn't feedback for being good at school or being good at my job or losing weight. It was just being me. And that self-esteem boost from something other than my weight was just, again, absolutely mind-blowing. And as I went along and my weight restored and I got better cognitive function, and I could assess then, I could tackle the problems that I'd had and see what it was that anorexia was taking away from me and what it was that I'd missed out on. And that gave me the strength that once I got to a healthy weight, I could maintain it, I could enjoy life, I could actually live rather than existing as I had done for 12 years. And... The, uh, and... I started to get angry, not with myself for being, for ruining my family's life and for just messing everything up, but actually with the illness. I got angry for it messing up my life and for messing up the life of my friends. And that was uh, huge motivating. And part of the reason why I called my book Becoming John was because that's kind of the process I went through because anorexic John had just been there for 12 years and I'd lost myself. I just didn't know anything about the real John. And through this entire process, that's what it was. <coughs> I was discovering who I was, what I was like away from the illness, what qualities I'd had, what people appreciated about me. And it was that that really sort of stood out for me. And I'll do the... Uh, now, I usually hate stuff like this. I really do. But this kind of thing actually helped. When I took my diary at the end of every day, I would write the positive things that happened because a lot of days in hospital are quite grim. 
but if it was a game of Scrabble or a crossword I'd completed or something like that, I would always end it with that and with positive mental attitudes because that's the only thing that gets you through because you have to keep focused on what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and what it is you're trying to achieve. And it's my belief in terms of eating disorders that you really need three things to start your recovery. And one is the desire to change, and I've yet to meet anyone, regardless of how deep their eating disorder is, that doesn't want things to be different. Everyone wants things to be different. A lot of people have lost hope. A lot of people disguise it very, very well. But that desire is always there. But that's nowhere near enough, and it certainly wasn't enough for me. I lost count of how many times something would happen. When I got diagnosed with osteoporosis, I thought, right, that's it, now you have to change. But even that didn't flick the switch for me. When it came to eating something extra or not going for that extra walk, I couldn't do it. And that's why Kimridge was so, so important to me because I needed someone to break the dialogue in my head between anorexia and me. I needed someone to get in there and push anorexia back a little bit and tell me something different and to support me when I was freaking out over having an extra chip and not going for a walk and to reassure me that what I was doing was the right thing. And from that, and being given the space and the time to analyse my anorexia and see what lay beyond it and to take the lessons from Jess and the other people that have recovered, I began to get the belief in myself that I could do it. Because it doesn't matter how much you want to change and how much support you have, unless you actually believe in yourself, it won't happen. Because to be honest, the first time I was in Kimridge, I knew I'd put on weight and I'd get to a healthy weight, but I didn't really believe there was any chance of actually sorting out all the other stuff, which is why I never tried to deal with it. And there are a lot of bad days in amongst all the good ones. And it's that belief <coughs> that keeps you going. It keeps you motivated through all the bad stuff. And, you know, and now my recovery is continuing. I'm like four years into it. And I'm not really recovered yet because there's still issues I've got to work on. Exercise is still too important. But that's cool because life is great, you know. And I'm not angry about anorexia anymore because whatever happened and however I went through, it's got me to the point where I am now, and that's fine. I'm happy with myself, I'm happy with who John is, and I'm happy with the life I have at the moment. And having a girlfriend that didn't know anorexic John is a great help as well, and that's really helped me to move on. Because with my parents, it's still a little bit in the background. It's still affected our relationship. I kind of get this thing that they're still watching me sometimes. And having someone else in my life that didn't know anything about it has been amazingly and hugely positive. And I don't know if I'm going to get there. I think I will. But I'm four years into a recovery, trying to turn my brain around to thinking differently to the way that I turned it around for 14 years. And I worked damn hard for those 14 years to get it thinking in one direction. So, as I say, four, months, four years is, is fine with me. And I think, again, to quote my book, if you don't mind, this bit, I think, does sum it up quite nicely, actually, about what the whole point of recovery is. It's all about freedom. Freedom from the thoughts, freedom to make my own decisions, to choose what I want to do, to choose to do what to choose what I want and do what I want and to be the person that I can be. The actual person underneath the eating disorder that is just obliterated, that's in suspended animation for 10 years or so. 
And uh, yeah, freedom is good. Yeah, that's it. And uh, that's it. Any questions?